Welcome everybody to a new installment of a fireside chat and today we're, we're very fortunate to have Mr. Eric Knorr, retired technical sergeant from the Band of Flight and Eric Knorr is currently Professor Eric Knorr at the uh, University of Dayton. Amongst other things, he uh, keeps a very full plate in his retirement and so we'll just start by a, a general introduction. Uh, Mr. Knorr, tell us where, where you're from and kind of what landed you in the Air Force Bands. Sure. So uh, I'm an Ohio kid for the most part. I was born in Rochester, New York, but uh, moved to uh, my dad's alma mater, uh, the College of Worcester in, in Worcester, Ohio in 1974. Pretty much grew up there ever since. And uh, graduated high school, went to college there, got my Bachelor of Music and Trumpet performance there with uh, Dr. Jack Gallagher and a little bit with Gary Davis in my senior year. Uh, Gary kind of pointed me in the direction of my two schools that I went to next, which were the University of Akron for my master's, which is also where I met my wife, Michelle, as she was pursuing a piano performance degree. And uh, from there, after getting married, I moved to the University of Cincinnati College Conservatory of Music and, and started my doctoral work. Um, spent four years there, studied with both Alan Siebert and Marie Speziali, who's uh, retired uh, fourth utility from the uh, Cincinnati Symphony and uh, really kind of got to the end of my academic rope in terms of what I really wanted to do and and I wanted to play and so I started taking auditions and I took uh, a couple of orchestral auditions um, I think uh, it was maybe my third audition ever um, the Air Force being my fourth. My first audition was in the Canton Symphony where I lost to Ryan Anthony. That was back in 1988, 89, somewhere in there. And um, I think he's turned out to be an okay player from what I recall. Yes. Um, anyway, he, uh, I went on from, from Cincinnati to take a couple of orchestral auditions, as I said, and I was actually at a, a wedding with my wife in Dubuque, Iowa, and I was about as close as I was going to get to off at Air Force Base where the opening was with the Heartland of America Band in Omaha. And so I drove across Iowa, took the audition. It was a very unorthodox audition. I ended up, ended up auditioning in the commander's office with about 12 people in it. Uh, it was very semi-intimidating, actually, because there's no screen. There's no real acoustic area of any benefit to you. Um, and uh, the, the officer who hired me was uh, re retired. Colonel uh, Jessup, who went on to be conductor of the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. Uh, sadly, I discovered that he was retiring after I got out of basic training and showed up. Some of my first gigs were basically farewell gigs for him. Yeah. Um, but that's where I'm from. That's where I kind of made my way to the Air Force Bands, um, which honestly was a, the first four years was just sort of like a trial balloon. I was like, oh, I don't know, we'll see. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, I met some great people <clears throat> in fact, um, within the last week, uh, we just had a little bit of an old Air Force uh, Heartland of America Band hangout on Zoom, um, and it was great reminiscing about the six years that I spent there. Um, I started in 95 there and moved on to uh, here at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base for the final 14 years of my career, which when most other Air Force people hear that, they're like, you spent 14 years in one place. <laughs> um, yes, I did, but it wasn't necessarily of my own doing. <laughs> um, and uh, it was really kind of a happenstance situation. I had at one point orders to Alaska, oh. um, but it happened to be at a time when my son was a, becoming a senior in high school. And uh, many of you know that it, if you have a senior in high school, there's a military-wide program, uh, high school senior deferment program. And so I applied for that and it was approved. And as a result, I did not go to Alaska yeah. and uh, stuck it out until my 20 year uh, mark at uh, 2015. Um, I don't know if you want me to keep going, but I, I'm certainly glad Absolutely. to do the rest of my career at the moment. That's the whole point. Absolutely. All right. So um, uh, following retirement uh, and Actually, while I was in as well, I've been a freelancer in the Dayton area and Cincinnati area. Um, I'm a regular substitute with the Dayton Philharmonic as well as the Cincinnati Symphony and Cincinnati Pops. Um, and so it was really one of those things where I wanted to stay in this area as much as I could. But as 
you know, with the academic environment, it's very difficult to find a position uh, where you want to actually be. Yeah. You kind of go where the job is. And um, it was really right out of uh, the military that I started uh, heavily uh, applying for academic positions. Yeah. And uh, as it just so turned out, I ended up uh, starting uh, my, my post Air Force academic career at, at the University of Dayton. Uh, since 2010, I had been uh, instructor of high brass, both trumpet and horn at Central State University. And uh, so after five years there, I ended up moving. I think I had one, one year where I did both, uh, both at UD and Central. And then, um, and then I got a full-time position at the University of Dayton in 2016. And so I let the, the Central State thing uh, go. And I had been doing some other teaching in the area, St. Clair and other places. Um, but I've, I've loved being at UD. This is now my fourth year, uh, and I'm excited. Uh, every day we get new recruiting information, and we're going to have our best recruiting class ever for trumpets coming in next year with a total of six, nice. which brings my total studio to close to nine or ten. Yeah. Uh, trumpet ensemble will be about 15 or 16, so I'm, I'm really excited about things that are looking up there. Um, so that's the teaching side. In terms of the other things that I do, uh, kind of a funny story, I guess. Um, yeah, a lot of the admin jobs we have in the Air Force Band, um, publicity, operations, supply, um, I did almost all of them, except the music library. Yeah. And uh, which makes it particularly poignant and ironic that I am now the orchestral librarian for the Dayton Philharmonic. Um, which is a job that uh, has been held steadily by a former Air Force bandsman uh, now for, I think, hmm, about 25 years, uh, yeah. because I took uh, Chief Master Sergeant Bill Slusser's place. Uh, he was a member of the Strolling Strings in the Washington, D.C. Air Force Band, is a member of the second violin section of the Dayton Philharmonic, yeah. and he still is. Um, but uh, in 2016, uh, he chose to step away from the library job and I stepped in. So uh, it was an excellent way to uh, build a career, continue a career in this area with two different jobs that were pretty compatible together because uh, uh, the library job is, while never ending, um, it, it is at least malleable in terms of its schedule. And so uh, that's, that's what I do currently. Uh, all the other freelance things, as well as run my own group, Oakwood Brass, uh, who've been, you know, around since about 2001 with some of the um, friends and colleagues of mine from the Air Force Band at the time. Um, I'm the only one left <laughs> here in this area. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that's basically it. I'm, I'm sure there are other things that will pop up in my head as we go. Yeah. And, you know, it's uh, something that is very inspiring and admirable to new bandsmen such as myself is, is seeing those that have retired, but by no means have hung it up. In fact, you're probably busier than you ever have been. And uh, I think that's important that, you know, you're, you're a musician and airman for life, really. Everything that you've done in the Air Force uh, continues, you know, to, to be a strength. And so maybe we'll kind of spill into that. Uh, Maybe tell us a little bit of, so you, you started off in a, at the Band of Flight, maybe some ensembles that you were in and maybe some you didn't expect because a lot of times maybe people that are looking at the Air Force or, or new to the Air Force, it's ever changing, ever evolving. And many times you have, we'll call it opportunity uh, to be participating in new ensembles that maybe you didn't see yourself in. So sure. you're a trumpet player, I'm a French horn player. Um, you know, if, if I expected to spend my whole career just in a brass quintet, that's probably not going to happen. And so there's opportunities to form new ensembles and whatnot. I, I think you've done a lot of that. And so maybe, maybe give us a little gist of, of what you did, what you created. Sure. Well, even going back to Offit, uh, when I arrived at Offit, um, I was actually taking Andy Wilson's place. And Andy Wilson had left to go be the principal trumpet of the uh, well, not principal right away, but he, he ended up being the principal trumpet of the Washington, D.C. Air Force Band. Yeah. And um, it was a really strong brass section and a really strong group overall. Um, and evidenced by their CDs uh, that I, I remember doing a little research prior to 
auditioning because I didn't really know much of anything about the Air Force bands. And uh, I was really encouraged by the fact that music was put first. Um, obviously, we're an airman before anything else, right. but music was our primary job and responsibility um, with secondary responsibilities filling in the rest of your, your day. Yeah. Um, and so when I arrived, I, I was fresh off of being a part of the Cincinnati Wind Symphony with Eugene Corporan, who later went on to North Texas and to do great things there. And we were doing all kinds of new works and recordings and CDs and we toured Japan and it was fascinating. But you know, when I got to um, the band at Offit for the first time, I remember thinking, we're playing all the war horses of the concert band repertoire. And, and honestly, it either had been years since I had done it or, um, sometimes I encountered pieces I'd never played before. Yeah. And so, uh, because I'd kind of predetermined my path at my master's degree as an orchestral player. So I didn't participate in the band at, at Akron, um, but did at Cincinnati. So it was kind of strange. Yeah. But uh, in any case, um, I did the usual things that a classical player would do at first. Um, I split the principal chair with my friend Nick Althaus, who's now in the uh, Pershings, or no, he's in the Army Field Band, excuse me. Um, and uh, later when he left for Germany, I, I became the principal of that band in, in the concert band mm -hmm. and the quintet, of course. Uh, I did a little jazz band playing early on, which I had done all throughout my career. I, it's one of the things I like to preach to the students now is that you need to be versatile and you need to really, you don't need to be the greatest jazz player and you don't need to have lead chops. It's kind of great if you do, but you, you can't always make that happen. Um, but you need to be familiar with styles intimately. Right. And that's where I felt like the Air Force Band's biggest need for a trumpet player is a versatile player. Yeah. And so initially when I got there, we were celebrating the 50th anniversary of the end of World War II. Um, and so we were wearing pinks and greens and playing yeah. Glenn Miller. And I was standing there in a jazz band. Yeah. Um, in fact, at our little hang we had the other night online, we were reminding ourselves that we sang in a barbershop quartet <laughs> um, right. as part of a show. So we did so many different things that I think – honestly is truly the way I feel I am from a musical standpoint. I love so many types of music. Yeah. Um, I'm not a snob about classical music yeah. um, in any way, shape or form. Um, I love Maynard Ferguson. I love Bill Chase. I love, you know, listening to good, good old big band music, uh, Basie and Ellington and, and Buddy Rich. Um, and so I think because I had an ear for it and because I also ended up developing uh, a relatively acceptable ability to play lead um, that it kind of um, provided some some opportunities for me later in my career. So when I got to write Pat, uh, kind of some of the same, mostly most of the classical stuff. Uh, we had a we had a full 60 piece band. Um, the way the trumpet section broke down, we had six players, sometimes seven. Uh, we had a we had a tuba player Tim Steep who actually could play lead trumpet, which was super bizarre, uh, but kind of cool to have seven players in the section. But the the way it split up was four in the jazz band, two in the quintet, and yeah. so um, I was pretty well established in the quintet. Um, but later in my career, when we took uh, we had a couple of people retire, and we also were about to experience the personnel reduction that we that we experienced in in 2012-13. Um, I ended up playing lead in the last jazz band uh, tour that the, the band of flight ever did. Yeah. Um, I, you couldn't have told me I was going to do that in 1995. That's for sure. Um, and strangely enough, that's led to me being a, um, an on-call lead pops player yeah. um, in the Dayton Philharmonic um, and also in all the national touring productions that come through Dayton. Yeah. Uh, that are hired by a local contractor, uh, Bob Gray. So um, not all of them. Uh, Charlie Pernard and I sometimes uh, will dicker over who's going to do what based on the highest note in the book. Um, and uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's a fun career to have had that opportunity to not just play 
you know, the classical stuff that you're, that I'm used to playing. Um, I skipped over one op big opportunity that they came to us uh, and to me in the band uh, at, at Wright Pat, which was 2010, mm -hmm. um, when our uh, band of flight was tasked to man a, a, a Navy deployment oh. on the USS Comfort, which was going into the Caribbean. Uh, it was not long after the, the uh, hurricane that had really destroyed Haiti. And uh, they were on a humanitarian mission, and they were joining music with that mission, uh, which was a perfect match. Yeah. And um, the only thing that it did to us, though, was it took a, a slightly larger, larger number of people to do that deployment. I think it was close to 10 or 12, and to include our commander, because we were sending a brass quintet, but also with a rhythm section and vocalist component to it, so it would be a slightly more diverse product. And um, when now, I, think it, I, I think I have a photo of that was that he's now Colonel Mensch was he amazing? Correct. He's yeah. at the Pentagon at the moment, and he's about to go. Once all the movements are lifted, he's about to go be the commander of the band in Germany okay. again. Okay. Uh, he was the commander in Germany uh, maybe four or five years ago. Yeah. Um, but in any case, uh, as he was leaving, shortly before he left. Um, I had this idea that kind of came to me, uh, admittedly, from Matt Erickson, my friend uh, back at Offit, who had um, done a similar product, which is a large brass ensemble. Yeah. Um, we did it both the way he did it, but also and added a component to it that changed it. Um, initially, he started out with a straight up brass ensemble. Um, not sure if in the early going he had a vocalist, but what we did later is we added a... Um, a vocalist and a rhythm section to our to our lineup so that we could basically fulfill the concert band's mission uh, without a without a conductor without without an officer yeah. uh, or commissioned officer while they were out on deployment yeah. and uh, we played the same venues and drew some of the same crowds um, and played and programmed a program that was very close to a concert band program um, I felt as if the years that I had been in up to that point, I had certainly seen the model for which uh, was very successful yeah. to, to program a concert band concert. And, and, you know, it wasn't that we didn't have an officer and that made it different, better. It didn't. It was the fact that we were doing things that were similar to the concert band but we're kind of our own self-run organization. Um, I ended up because, you know, what did they say in the military? If you come up with a good idea, you better be prepared to volunteer to do it all. Well, that's kind of what ended up happening. Um, yeah. Most of it. I ended up being the operations person, the publicity person, um, the NCUIC, the MC, play trumpet. Yeah. Um, and it was very, very demanding. I remember telling my wife at one point, uh, it's seven o'clock, I'm still at work, I'll be home. <laughs> yeah. But I, I really, you know, it just goes to show, I guess if you really care about something, you're really gonna work very, very hard to make sure that it succeeds, and it did. Um, there's still some great videos out there on the Band of Flight webpage on YouTube that are evidence of, of, our, of our product. And not only was it rewarding, I think it was rewarding to every person who uh, was a part of it, within the band family. Um, I remember hearing lots of things, <clears throat> you know, that this was the highlight of my Air Force career. Um, this was the most fun I've ever had, you know, playing music. And and th those were really uh, fun memories. And the, the main thing is we did our job. We, we really delivered a great product to the American public and and paid homage to our Air Force veterans and, and every show as we would always do anyway. Yeah. And that's a good place to kind of segue. I know you and I have spoken in the past, um, kind of the, the pinnacle of, of reaching somebody, you know, is, is taps, which is something that every trumpet player that's uh, going to be in the military is going to, it's going to be a significant part of, of their career, not only from a number standpoint of how many times you probably will end up playing taps, but the um, real emotional 
attachment to that that you will you will find mm -hmm. well one thing i thought of as you're talking <clears throat> is the first time i think i ever played taps was in the boy scouts on a crappy bugle that they give you that the mouthpiece is not a comfortable mouthpiece um and i remember you know the boy scouts for me was all about camping yeah um and many people were in it for the badges and for making rank and and making Eagle Scouts someday. And I remember leaving the Boy Scouts because I had jazz band on Monday nights right. <laughs> in high school. And, and uh, so I, I, but I still remember the, the whole service aspect of the Boy Scouts. Mm -hmm. uh, not that I ever thought I'd be in the military after I left, but um, when I first started playing bugle details, uh, it was in basic training. Yes. And it was an, a, a welcome respite <laughs> from everything else that was going on because, first of all, as a trumpet player, you had a unique responsibility um, in DOD instruction that you're the only person that's allowed to play taps, um, your instrument. Yeah. And so uh, being able to play bugle calls and details within, within basic training, I remember distinctly and feeling like I held a special responsibility. <clears throat> and that hasn't changed. Yeah. Uh, when I was in the Air Force, we supported active duty funerals within our seven state region. Uh, and I remember traveling, you know, six, seven hours on a van with the honor guard to do that. Yeah. Um, and obviously, usually at the last minute. Yeah. Um, and in many cases, uh, we weren't released to, to do that because our schedule was so busy that we were uh, obviously either on the road or in a rehearsal or something like that. Um, but I still did a fair share of them, <clears throat> sadly, because they were active duty members. Um, but when I retired in 2015, I actually kind of heard from Master Sergeant Chris Jeffrey, who's, who had retired a few years before me. And uh, he had been hooked up with a Master Sergeant in the Army in Middletown who uh, was specifically tasked uh, people to do military details and um, he was really happy to have myself uh, Sergeant Diamond who's now teaching trumpet at, at Wright State University in the area because then we were able to be called and and if we could we'd get out and and do these these um, veterans funerals yeah. of all services um, and it it really wasn't until then. I mean, yes, I had some very emotional times seeing, especially grieving families who have lost someone of a very young age. Uh, but especially for these veterans later in life, um, music brings it all home. It's a sense of closure when you hear those notes sounded. And I take that responsibility very seriously. And I believe it is our job as trumpet players, as long as we can still um, even if we can't walk, we can get ourselves out to a service in a field somewhere and play taps. Yeah. And, um, it's, it, it brings closure. Uh, you see the emotional impact immediately upon playing almost to the point where I can't look, uh, yeah. at the family because, um, uh, this master sergeant from the army said he wanted to make sure that we were visible. And the reason he said that is because the digital bugle is a real thing. Um, there's a there's an actual device that goes inside the bell of a bugle that a non-player will just hold and press a button. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I thought that's just not right. Um, it's better than a CD with a boombox, but it's it's not right in the sense of paying tribute to the service that the veteran has paid. And um, so that's why I want to make it a, a point to my students, and I do about. Uh, coming with me and watching this take place and becoming a part of it when they leave school and uh, never forget that a trumpet is is really the only instrument that should render taps yeah so. yeah I can imagine just uh, the impact of, of them seeing how much effort you've put into making sure it's all refined and, and coordinated and all that it, it really is, is something that's I'm sure encapsulated in in their minds, uh, you know, from then on. And, and like you said, it really gives them a, a sense of, of, of closure and, and feeling like they're, you know, the person they lost was, was sent off correctly and, and, yeah. and honored. And that yeah. maybe spills into the next kind of maybe overarching talk because 
I'm sure you guys had similar concepts for, for the Air Force mission, the Air Force Band's mission, I should say. And currently ours is Honor, Inspire, Connect. And I think you probably had something like that or, or similar uh, when you were in. And so maybe kind of, maybe tying into that, what you learned most about musicianship as far as your whole Air Force career, maybe the kind of the biggest musical takeaway, but then also the biggest Air Force or, or even human takeaway. And it probably is gonna tie back to some stuff you've already mentioned, but you know. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, back to the, the brass ensemble that we created, uh, Prism Brass, yeah. uh, which was often confused with Prison Brass. <laughs> uh, we were non-felon brass players. I can, I can guarantee you that. Um, as the leader of that group, and as the leader of Right Brass for 10 years, uh, the quintet, um, I was obviously maybe more at the front line of meeting sponsors who generally were veterans. Yeah. Um, but I also remember making uh, a specific point, especially when the concert band was on the road, that when the concert ended, um, put your horn away as fastly and as safely as you can. Yeah. And then make your way to the exits before yeah. you change. Keep your uniform on. Yeah. And and talk to people. Yeah. And the veterans that you meet, you may not know historically much about what they did, where they did it. You may not know everything. That's doesn't matter. Yeah. The fact that someone in uniform is standing there talking to them and shows that we care about what they did. Uh, we played their services song at the end of every concert and we saw them stand up. And I can't tell you how many times you get a lump in your throat and you still have to take a breath and play <laughs> um, because that is something that does not go away. Um, and um, it shouldn't. Yeah. It's, it's the kind of thing uh, I remember hearing speeches at the Air Force Museum, the National Museum of the United States Air Force. Yeah. Um, that through less than 3% of the country serves in the military. And yeah. that stuck in my head too, because now we don't have a collective memory about service campaigns. Thank goodness we have people in leadership positions that draw it to our attention. Big NFL sport, you know, sports leagues bring us all kinds of armed services, tributes and things like that. Yeah. But um, just like, the regular person walking down the street needs to know what kind of sacrifice our veterans went through. And so um, it, those are my most memorable, my most memorable overall takeaway. Yeah. Um, probably the most memorable overall experience. It's a tough one because yeah. obviously uh, from a musical standpoint, everything we did with Prison Brass was so much fun. Yeah. And we did our job and we were having fun doing it. <clears throat> but also, um, and this will be a slightly longer story, but uh, when we deployed, and I believe to date we're still the only brass quintet uh, with a drummer uh, to, to, I shouldn't say that, it sounds like I'm being talking bad about drummers. Uh, we were a six-person ensemble, but we were a brass quintet with a drummer. I think they were um, percussionists. Or, you know. There you go. There you go. <laughs> so we went to Iraq and Afghanistan and even in the Horn of Africa, we went to Djibouti yeah. and went to Kyrgyzstan and United Arab Emirates and Kuwait, uh, played for President Bush and Ambassador Crocker and General Petraeus uh, after the first of the year. And the big takeaway from that trip is we, we diversified the brass quintet repertoire yeah. because uh, when you think brass quintet, you don't think about anything except classical music or perhaps marches if you've seen a ceremony performed by right brass so uh one of the things that we did was we had a lot of special arrangements done and one of the arrangements we had done was queen's bohemian rhapsody yeah but it was really inspired by a group from austria called no zeal brass who had done a version of bohemian before this in which there was singing and choreography and all this great brass playing of course but uh, we did it and I remember we did it for uh, the crowd of troops that were formed early in the morning, probably four or 5,000 troops early in the morning in January of 20, 2008, uh, awaiting President Bush's arrival. Yeah. And uh, 
so we were there specifically. I mean, it was kind of happenstance. We were coming through doing our leg through Kuwait and playing performances there. Um, and we were tasked immediately, obviously, to provide not only pre-ceremony music, but also play Hail to the Chief uh, and honors for the president. And that was a, a tremendous honor for us to do that. But uh, we also played Bohemian Rhapsody for that crowd of assembled troops. And um, I used to tell this story all the time. I think the group got tired of me telling it. But when we played it, they sang along. Yeah. And uh, that is the closest I will get to knowing what it's like to be in a rock band yeah. uh, and have them sing all the lyrics back to you. Yeah. Um, and it was it was great. But I, I told that story to... Um, the tuba player in Nozio Brass, when we came home, yeah. wrote him an email just out of the blue. I said, hey, I want to let you know where your your inspiration led and um, to an unexpected place, I'm sure. Yeah. And um, and I said to him at the end of the email, you know, if Nozio Brass ever decides to tour the United States, we would love to host you here in Dayton, Ohio. Yeah. I had no business saying that. <laughs> Um, I had no authority to say that. I had no money behind it. It was complete, um, ridiculous statement to make. Yeah. Didn't think anything of it. A year went by. I wondered if they even received the email. Um, and I, I got an email back and they said, um, no, I take that back. They did respond right away yeah. saying thank you, but nothing about the tour. Yeah. Then a year later, they said, we're planning a U.S. tour and we'd like to come to Dayton, Ohio. And I said, oh, Okay. Yeah. So I went and asked our commander at the time. I said, here's something I've done <laughs> about a year ago. And uh, he vaguely knew of the group. As soon as he started listening to more of their stuff, he was like, absolutely, we got to make something work. And to date, it's one of the very few performances they've done with another larger group. And certainly the only one they've done with an Air Force ensemble. And we performed at the National Museum of the United States Air Force. As I look at the poster right here in front of me, um, on my wall, March 24th, uh, 2010, yeah. I believe. And it was one of the most special nights of music making I think I've ever experienced. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, I, it was a combination of trying to play and laughing your, you know, what off, yeah. um, while just watching virtuosity. Yeah. Uh, and crowd absolutely loved it. It was yeah. sold. I mean, we always sell out there, but this was a particularly fast sellout. Uh, for that for that concert. Um, so those were probably, that's probably my biggest musical highlight and my biggest takeaway. Um, being a part of uh, the right, right Brass Quintet and running that group um, was a tremendous honor and uh, one that, uh, you know, I, I will never forget all the people that we've had in that group. Uh, we've, we've had a really good time uh, with the group doing all kinds of different performances. Um, I think the group can, I think what I really found in the Air Force is that <clears throat> with enough imagination and ingenuity, you can really, um, you can really make a lot of cool things happen. Yeah. Um, and, and that's what I hope the, the future looks like. Um, you know, I, when we took the personnel reduction in 2013 and I still, you know, those were two of the hardest years in my career because we were experiencing the downturn in personnel, but still had to maintain or were trying to maintain some of the same missions that we had with all 45 people there and prior to that 60 people. So uh, it was very challenging, but also very rewarding because we did new arrangements there and we did, you know, rock band and horns and we kind of had a, a nice mix of, of ensembles uh, that we could put, put forth yes. that were traditional and somewhat unorthodox. Yeah. You know, one thing to touch upon is, uh, yeah, you, I think you mentioned to me, I don't know if we've mentioned yet in the interview, um, kind of how uh, extensive your AOR was and how important that probably was in general, but also in the midst of, you know, uh, as, as the Air Force maybe doesn't have as many personnel for the bands, not every community is, is blessed to have the presence of an Air Force band. And, mm -hmm. and so I maybe can speak of, of that importance, the, the community engagement aspect of, of things that we do. And, and, you know, people come to the museum and see you and, and all that, but uh, you were busy. You were on the road a lot out in the community, out in schools and various venues and, and maybe, you know. Yeah. Uh, we've had a very busy touring schedule and, 
I think there was some confusion probably with some people thinking that we had 45 people um, and that those 45 people would all go out at the same time. Um, that never happened. Obviously, we diversify the group. Um, the concert band occupied almost everyone except for our rock band that was kind of on their own and perhaps an anthem vocalist that we would leave behind uh, to handle any ceremonial details while the, while the band, the bigger band, was out. But um, generally it broke down uh, that when the concert band wasn't on the road, we had a jazz band and we had the two quintets, brass quintet and woodwind quintet, that would also go out and tour. Yeah. So it became a very mostly predictable touring schedule, but also one that demanded versatility because uh, we not only had to come back from a jazz band tour and then go right into a concert band tour, um, it made for um, a lot of long rehearsal days, that's for sure, because um, as, as you know, in the, in the commercial world, uh, rehearsals are probably fewer than you need because you have to pay everyone to be there. <laughs> and uh, in the Air Force, we have the luxury of of being paid at a salary rate, uh, so time is something that can um, be capitalized upon in a good way most of the time. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I've lost track on what your question was. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, the the engagement with the community and and how important that oh, was that you were in. And... Absolutely. I mean, seven states we covered. So so Michigan, Western PA, Ohio, Indiana, uh, Kentucky, West Virginia, and part of Western Maryland. Yeah. Um, we got to Western Maryland a handful of times in the 14 years I was there. Yeah. Um, but we toured quite a bit into Michigan, uh, loved touring in Michigan, had great sponsorship and, and support there, especially. Yeah. Um, and it was nice to go there in the summertime, I must admit. Yeah. Um, great stuff in Western Pennsylvania too. But I think that, um, a lot of people may think that the concert band is sort of an antiquated vehicle for relaying Air Force messages. And I would argue that it's not, because I don't think that at any point in time, going to a summer park concert with your folding chair to hear a military band in uniform will ever get old. Right. Um, <clears throat> it's something that obviously we're still hanging on to at the highest levels of the, of the bands in the military. So, um, it is tragic that by no fault of anyone at Wright Patterson that we are now uh, not in possession of a concert band anymore. Right. Um, and it, though it brings even more into focus the fact that the group that is there and now only has discovered the state of Ohio um, needs to be a presence in communities um, and hopefully can be that presence of an air of a, you know uniform person because um, I think it puts a face on it and it does not it can't get uh, you know especially in this time of this pandemic where we're doing things remotely you know you just see the the muted impact yeah. that that a that a, a distance can uh, sadly bring uh, we don't get the same goosebumps we get when we sit in community listening to music together. And I think for many of those veterans, um, you know, sitting there and listening to their services song in person uh, has got to be a, you know, one of those just special experiences that we that we have with music and specifically music in the military. Absolutely. Yeah, there's just, um, you know, I'm, I'm fairly new, but, you know, I've already seen the incredible bond that, that you have with, with your, not only your fellow bandsmen, but, you know, fellow, 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 sorry to speak, uh, fellow <laughs> military. And, and like you said earlier, that's why it's so important to, as bandsmen, talk, talk with those, those veterans after concerts or really any chance you have. And it's, it's, it's really cool to see. We, we have a number of, of veterans we see at every single concert, wherever it might be. And, and there's something, really humbling and special about that and, and it's like you look for their faces you know and um and, and you know speaking about the impact that you know i've seen so far we recently played a concert at the museum as part of our annual heart series heritage and one of the pieces we did was an arrangement of uh, hymn to the fallen by um john williams and so we adapted it to have uh, brass quintet with narration 
and we tailored the narration to honor a local hero, hero uh, William Fitzenbarger, who was a Medal of Honor recipient post-mortem, you know, obviously gave the ultimate sacrifice. And looking out at the audience and, you know, had to kind of bring myself back and to make sure I was playing the right notes, but, you know, catching tears and catching just the impact that had. We had, had yeah. fortunate to have video and, and whatnot along with the, uh, the performance. And so having them be able to see, you know, William Pittsburgh throughout his, his stages and, and, and all that, it was, it was really one of probably the coolest experiences I've had so far, but I'm, I'm looking forward to, to more of those. Um, and, and actually you just reminded me of one that uh, had slipped my mind temporarily um, was playing, I think during this period when we had drawn down already, uh, we played a ceremony to, to uh, commemorate the Doolittle Raiders yeah, I think their latest anniversary was within the last month or so. Um, and at that time, there were four left. And um, I think the consensus at the time was this might be the last time we do this. Yeah. And I remember being tasked to play taps for that. And I and I it may have even part of it, not the visual, but part of the audio, I think, made it onto the kind of the human interest story at the end of the NBC Nightly News. Yeah. Um, because they were there, all the all the national news outlets were there, because we had four left, three were there with us, and one was in a, a nursing home and was watching remotely. Yeah. Um, but that was, you know, talk about a special experience that's, that's um, as you kind of alluded to, it's tough to focus on your job um, when you've got to play and, and not crack. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, definitely something that I, I feel like I, I feel like I got better at. I think a lot of people have come up to me and said, how do you play taps when there's so much heavy stuff around? I said, I, I just experienced, I've just done it so many times. It doesn't mean it affects me any less. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of a, a another, you know, uh, cool experience was we unveiled the Memphis bell that they restored. Right. I saw that. Yeah. In the museum. And, uh, one of the gentlemen was there on the original crew and gosh, 90 something. And I don't know where he got the surge of energy, but he, they stood like a rocket, you know, when it was time. And uh, it's, it's almost like I have this, this, uh, this idea that veterans never die. And I don't think they ever do, you know? And, and yeah. that was just a prime example of, of uh, you know, no matter if their body's starting to fail them, they, they have, just uh, over yeah, bounds. Just that energy comes from somewhere, and it's it's really cool. It's really something to see that, you know. Yeah, definitely. Well, you know, I don't want to take too much more of your time, but maybe leave us with uh, a couple final thoughts. One being, what would be your biggest tip or tips to new bandsmen that are they're entering the career field now? Kind of the biggest lessons you you learned, and and maybe kind of. For some of us, it takes a while. You know, I'm, I'm still learning the ropes of, of being a musician in the military, and uh, I certainly value getting that mentorship from, from people that have done it. And you did the full 20 and have continued to, to flourish in, in the community. And so, you know, I, I certainly would, and I know a lot of our audience members would love to hear kind of your, your big your tips, your trumpet tips for, for uh, entering into the Air Force. Well, obviously, it's a completely different time than when I joined. I think I mentioned, you know, that I I was celebrating the 50th anniversary of the end of World War II. Yeah. And um, one thing that I saw in the 20 years um, is even though our vehicles or uh, our genres, if you will, our concert bands or jazz bands, um, they haven't really changed too much, yeah. but they've had to change for the style of music that the veterans that we're playing for today were listening to when they were in their service. Right. And so um, I think that's, uh, I remember playing House of the Rising Sun and Brass Quintet yep. with Wright Brass. And I'm like, wow, this is, this is a real departure, yeah. but it speaks more to the, to the Vietnam vets. Yep. Um, and uh, that's what we need to do. So now where are we? We're probably playing. I mean, I've played, God bless the USA more times than I care to admit, but that's from, you know, obviously the Gulf war. Yeah. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious to see where we go from here to what music we'll play in the future for our veterans of the current war. Yeah. Um, like I said, from our deployment, we kind of figured some of that out, 
but I think it'll be up to the future generation to figure out what works best. And I think it's probably going to be a balance yeah. um, as it's probably always been of heritage yeah. and current music that yeah. speaks to veterans and active duty people of today. Um, and I think we need to think for the, for the player coming in now, uh, don't be so locked in mentally to what you think you should do. Uh, be open to, to opportunities, both that are, that you're voluntold to do. Right. And also that you could possibly create for yourself and other people in the, in the career field. Absolutely. Um, I think there's lots of great new and different ideas to share music. And I think sadly in this pandemic, we're figuring out some of those things because we have the time. Yeah. Um, but uh, I'm interested to see what, what the, what the future of the air force bands looks like uh, 20, 25, 30 years from now. Um, and I sure hope, you know, knock on wood that it's, it's still alive and kicking and doing the things that it should do. Uh, the armed forces medley stars and stripes forever, uh, you know, paying, paying homage in many, so many different, you know, musical works of John Williams to, to our veterans. Um, I think all of that matters. And I think overall it's, it's affirmed, you know, especially when you look at the use of classical music in films and TV it hasn't gone away. It's yeah. just in a different, slightly different package. Um, but we just have to figure out ways that we can best leverage it. Yeah, I think that's great advice. Um, you know, yeah. kind of a underpinning concept behind starting these fireside chats is the con connecting generations concept. And so I like what you said, because I think as Air Force bandsmen, staying attuned to all those points that we have to hit. So staying attuned to what are the current generations that we're honoring, you know, at particular times, but not, also not losing sight of the generations uh, upon which we built and making sure that, you know, we're connecting that. Cause I think there's just, especially, you know, anybody that's, I'm not personally, uh, you know, I'm the first in, in my family to serve, but there are people that that is a, a, a consistent flow in the family to, to serve. And I think there's very, something very special about, you know, kind of hearing what your grandfather was um, hearing back when he was serving and, and right. really building those bridges across and not losing sight of that, you know, it's as a delicate well. balance because uh, as you know, older people think that the previous, the next generation's music is terrible yeah. and so on and so on and so on. Yeah. So you have to really make some interesting calls about, um, about being the most accessible musical product to yeah. the public. Uh, and that's always what I would think of. And, um, you may want to do some things for you yeah. or your own musical soul every once in a while. Um, and that's okay, but not an entire program of that right? Uh, because it ends up being a, a self-serving uh, en enterprise. Yeah. Um, but, but there were definitely moments when we could throw in something that, that was really, it had mass appeal, but we knew that it was, it was really special to us. And then we played something that was, you know, incredibly engaging. In fact, I was just thinking in the NFL draft taking on going on tonight, um, Staff Sergeant Andrew Duncan, who's separated is now principal trombone in the Lexington Philharmonic and works for Procter and Gamble. Um, he arranged all of the music to the old NFL films. Oh, no kidding. We heard. And we did that with the brass ensemble and we got John Facenda's voice that we kind of, uh, we hit, we hit a play button that went through the loudspeakers at the right time. Yeah. Uh, most of the time, I remember having to play piccolo and, and reach down and hit a button to get him to play. But um, it, it's that kind of music that has that mass appeal. It, you don't matter. It doesn't matter how old you are. Yeah. Um, most everyone loves football. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, it's maybe those sorts of things that we can pull focus to and gravitate towards that will, that will help the career field survive. Yeah. I just thought of something that, and it's because we've spoken previously, but, uh, you know, speaking of programming, I remember you, you mentioned a term, Bach and awe. Bach oh, and yes. awe. And Bach and awe. Deployment days, right? So you, you mentioned the Bohemian Rhapsody, but you uh, were able to play some other things as well. And so you kind of came up with the, they had the shock and awe during that era. Shock and awe. And, uh, we, did, and awe. 
we did Bach Contrapunctus number nine and yeah. followed it with Queen's Bohemian Rhapsody. Yeah. Uh, which is a can't can't be any more of a diverse demonstration of styles, yeah. um, back to back. So, and it may have been you know, we were pretty fond of that term at the time. And it, it, it's the <laughs> exemplary of uh, take a risk sometimes, and and you're sure. uh, rewarded with them. People people loved it, you know, and, and some people might have been resistant. Oh, you know, careful not to play Bach on on deployment, but they loved it. So sometimes you know test the waters a little bit and, and kind of, you know, see, see what happens, see, see what the response is. Real quick, here's my theory on that. Yeah. If, if you do anything with virtuosity, yeah, it's impressive. It doesn't matter what era it's from. Yeah. Um, and we tried to get as close to virtuosity as we could. And yeah. in many cases, most of the time, uh, people were truly stunned by what we're able to do, especially with just five people and a drummer. Um, and a percussionist. Yeah. Um, love you, Bob. Yeah. And um, and I think that's the main thing. I mean, we, we, we were approached at one point in Kuwait by a guy who spent a lot of time in New York City, and he looked like a, a slightly older guy, and he said, you know what? You're as good as anything you'd find in the city. Yeah. And I said, wow, all right, thank you. Yeah. You know, we'll take it. You know, especially when we're away from our families, we missed Christmas entirely that year. Um, you know, it was really, it was really heartening to hear those comments. And that, you know, as, as far as people listening, especially people maybe looking at, at the military jobs, we have an astounding level of, of musicians and have, and we've been very fortunate uh, to get that. But mm -hmm. there's, there's a bar you know, that we, we have very high standards in, in the Air Force bands. And, and that's incredibly rewarding as a musician to, to get the honor of getting to work with, you know, just top notch musicians that, that value that. And, you know, uh, Mr. Nor being a prime example of that, that, you know, he doesn't hang up the hat, you know, he retired and, and he's still pumping away every day, wanting to be better chase that, you know, always being virtuosic and, and, bringing his best. And I thought of the word conviction, I think probably, especially when you were playing taps is that you didn't fall into that. Okay. Well, this is just num another, you know, taps number 1000. Everyone is, is approached and played with conviction and people notice that, you know? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, this has been fantastic. I don't know if you have any parting words, but you know, I don't want to, keep you too much longer and, and this has just been immensely valuable to, to myself and, and anybody watching to be able to get a, a deep perspective on somebody that's been there done that and uh, can give some, some real tips to, to people maybe starting their career maybe looking at the military bands or general public that want to just get a deeper understanding of, of what we do and why we why we exist? What, what our true essence is um, as as military bands, as as Air Force bandsmen. And so I, I thank you for your, your time. This is wonderful. No problem. And yeah. my main bit of advice is keep practicing. You know, I mean that's, that's the one thing that uh, I knew first in my first four years that um, I I wasn't really in this to be behind a desk. Even though in many cases you can get pushed there. Yeah. Um, but I, I wanted to continue to play because that's really what makes me who I am. And and that's why uh, I kept going. And you probably, uh, speaking of that, I'm sure you found as you went through your career, becoming more efficient becomes a thing. So you may not have the hours of, of leisure, you know, to practice. Like I remember that being in school, you got all day, every day. So I would say probably you have similar advice for, for your students and students at large. Take advantage of why you have those hours as, as liberally as you do. And, and, you know, maybe currently in this, this um, unfortunate time that you may be quarantined, practice, 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 listen, listen, listen. Um, yeah. I would recommend go listen to some of the, the pieces that uh, Mr. Knorr mentioned. You know, we have a lot of, I think all the Air Force music is now digitally available, if not on Spotify and platforms like that. I believe if you go to the main Air Force webpage, you can stream uh, pretty yeah. much anything and everything, and that's just yeah, such a uh, such a gift to to have that. And so, and YouTube, there, you know, you know, Ms. Norris is absolutely correct that there's a plethora of, of band of flight videos and and Air Force videos at large to 
to go listen to and take advantage of, of listening to, to those bands. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you, sir. And, uh, you know, <laughs> that's not a good way to end the interview. <laughs> <laughs> In this day and age, it's just allergies. Okay. That's right. That's right. So. <laughs> well, All thanks right. for thank having me. Appreciate it.